Today I want to speak to you about the grace and the mercy of God. His mercy and His grace, you may have some understanding of it. I hope that you've experienced it or at least aware of experiencing it in salvation. All of us have experienced the mercy of God because upon committing sin, we are guilty and we deserve the penalty that sin brings. But because of God's grace and because of his mercy, he gives us time to come to repentance. And you know, if you're here today, it's not too late for you to have a close, intimate relationship with the Lord that's filled with joy and peace and a passion for serving Him. It's not too late. I've met many people that, for whatever reason, believed that they had sinned beyond the mercy of God. One gentleman in Atlanta shared about how he had had an affair. And in he had read in the New Testament where the Bible talks about adultery. And he said, it's just too late for me. He said, I've already completely blown it, messed up. And what he failed to understand was that God's grace is greater than all of our sin. God's grace is greater than adultery. God's grace is is greater than hypocrisy. God's grace is greater than greed. God's grace is greater than lying and dishonestly practicing your business. God's grace is greater than ignoring your children and failing to raise your family. Whatever it is that you've done, that you believe that you're beyond the grace of God. I'm telling you based upon what God's word says. Not based upon what I think or what I thought or how I feel about it. What God's word says, if you are still breathing and living, you are not beyond the grace and mercy of God. It is not too late for you to have a joy-filled relationship with the Lord. And that's the message of the book of Joel today. As we look at Joel chapter 2, we're looking at verses 1 through 17. And in this passage in Joel's time, Joel was an Old Testament prophet. The nation of Israel was being disciplined by God. I mean, the entire nation was being disciplined by God. God being slow to wrath, slow to anger. God being patient and gentle. God's patience had become exhausted with them. And they'd reached the point that God was coming upon the entire nation with a plague of locusts. And you say, well, what did that really mean for them? Well, in a time without refrigeration, a time without industrialization, a time that they didn't have preservatives like we had today it meant that the locusts ate everything and there was nothing for anybody to eat that's what it meant it meant that there was a plague that produced a famine for many people it meant it wiped out everything that they owned they had hit absolute rock bottom and yet in the midst of this Joel tells them he says yet Even now, you can still turn to the Lord. that's, That's the grace of God. Even when you have ignored him and ignored him and rebelled and done whatever you wanted to do, and you've done it for so long and to such an extent that God is ready to discipline you as a child, when you get to that point, even when you are in the midst of being disciplined by God, Yet even now, that's what Joel says, yet even now, the Father is waiting for us to return to him. Jesus told the story about two brothers. They were both 
sinful, but they had different sins that they were caught up in. One brother was caught up in self-righteousness and pride and arrogance. The other brother was caught up in the world. And so he went to his father and he asked for his inheritance. Probably one of the most disrespectful things you could do. He went to his father and he basically said, you know, Dad, I'm tired of waiting around for you to die. And I would just like to have what you're going to give me now. And because the father loved the son more than he loved his things, he gave it to him. And the son went off in a foreign land. And he had all the friends that money could buy. But when he squandered it all, a famine came. And the friends were gone. And he found himself with the only job he could find in a hog lot feeding hogs. And as nasty as that is for us today, for a first century Jew living by the Old Testament dietary laws, it was even more so. He had hit absolute rock bottom. But he thought he understood something about the grace and mercy of his father. Because the Bible says when he came to his senses, when he came to himself, then he said, I'll go home. And I'll ask my father to let me be a hired servant. He thought to himself, every hired servant in my father's household is living better than I'm living now. And so he went, and I can just imagine as he was walking up the road toward his his father's home, he's rehearsing in his mind what all he's going to say. He's thinking about what his brother's going to say to him. And he's thinking about what his father's going to say and how they're going to react when he tells them that everything is gone. It's all been squandered. And he's he's rehearsing in his head how he's going to beg his father to let him come home and let him work for his brother as one of the hired servants. And because he knows his father is gracious and merciful, he believes his father will hire him and let him work there. And you see, he was right that his father was gracious and merciful, but he totally misunderstood the extent of his father's grace and mercy. For he may have been in love with the world, but his father was in love with him. And the Bible says that when his father saw him, he ran and he fell on him and he hugged him and he kissed him. And then the Bible says that that he brought the ring. And he put it on his finger. And the significance of that is that the ring had the family crest. It was what was used to press into wax and to seal documents. What he did was is he handed his son a power of attorney over all his estate that was left. You see, the father didn't receive him back as a hired servant. The father brought him right back into his place in the family as a son and in that parable that Jesus told you and I we we may be the prodigal son the one that left and squandered everything trying to enjoy the world or we may be like the older brother who sat home and did what we were supposed to but begrudged every minute of it Whichever sinful lifestyle you may be caught up in, the Father, the Father represents God. And He is gracious and He is merciful. And He wants to love us and He wants us to prosper and He wants us to live in the joy of our relationship with Him. And so wherever you are in your life today, When you come to that moment, like the prodigal son, the Bible says when you come to your senses, you come to your self. The father is ready, and the father is waiting. And in the words of Joel, yet even now we can return to the Lord with all of our heart. Well, would you stand with me out of honor and reverence for God's word as we read Joel chapter 2. The passage that we're reading in verse 1 through 11 tells us about the 
the devastation that comes from the locusts as God's discipline is upon them. And then in verses 12 through 17, we read the call to come to the Lord. So listen to what the Bible says. Blow a trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord is coming. It is near. A day of darkness and gloom. A day of clouds and thick darkness. Like blackness there spread upon the mountains a great and powerful people. Their like has never been before. Nor will ever be again after them through the years of all generations. Fire devours before them. And behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them. But behind them a desolate wilderness, and nothing escapes them. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses, and like war horses they run. As with the rumbling of chariots, they leap on the tops of the mountains, like the crackling of a flame of fire devouring the stubble. Like a powerful army drawn up for battle, before their, them peoples are in anguish, all faces grow pale. Like warriors they charge, like soldiers they scale the wall. They march each on its way. They do not swerve from their path. They do not jostle one another. Each marches in its path. They burst through the weapons and are not halted. They leap upon the city. They run upon the walls. They climb upon the houses. They enter the windows like a thief. The earth quakes before them. The heavens tremble. The sun and the moon are darkened, and the stars withdraw their shining. The Lord utters his voice before his army, for his camp is exceedingly great. He who executes his word is powerful, for the day of the Lord is great and very awesome. Who can endure it? But listen to this. Yet even now, declares the Lord, Return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning. And rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a flat, fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people. Consecrate the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, even nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priest, the minister of the Lord, weep and say, Spare your people, O Lord, and make not your heritage a reproach. A byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Let's pray together. Father, I pray for the person that right now may be experiencing discipline like Jerusalem experienced in this day. Lord, I pray that they would hear your words from Joel. Yet even now, Return to me with all your heart. Father, I pray that you'd help this church to be an instrument to shine light into darkness and to draw people to your Son. May our focus be your kingdom. For it's in your Son's name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Something that's so important for us to understand in verses 1 through 11 as he talks about this locust plague that comes on. And the Bible compares them to an army. And it talks about how they, they come past the weapons, not halted. The weapons that were made to fight human armies, what good were they against the locust plague? And it talks about them scaling up the walls and devouring everything. The Bible describes this time when God's own people experienced the discipline of God because of their sin and rebellion against him. You see, all sin, rebellion, and disobedience will eventually bring you under either the wrath or the discipline of God. For those of us that are saved, there is no wrath to come for us. Jesus took the wrath of God upon himself when he died on the cross. And yet, we can still be disciplined just as earthly fathers discipline their children so the Lord disciplines us. Do you know that God gave Israel very clear commandments about how to live in the land? 
And what we're dealing with in Joel's time is the time when they had ignored God's commandments and instead chosen to live as they desired. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 26 through 28, it tells us about Moses' instruction from the Lord as the people were about to enter the promised land for the first time. You know, Moses took them up to the promised land. Spies went in, came back, gave a bad report. They decided not to go in. Forty years they wandered around. And then Moses goes back with them. He doesn't get to go in, but he prepares them to go in. And in that preparation, this is what he says from the Lord. See, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing, if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and the curse, if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God. But turn aside from the way that I'm commanding you today to go after other gods that you have not known. Well, all the book of Deuteronomy and all its specifics about what they could do and what they couldn't do in the promised land, how they should live and how they should not live, Moses is summing up for us here the intent of those commandments. If they did what God asked them to do, then God would bless them. And if they refused to do what the Lord commanded them to do, they would experience the discipline of God. And time and time again, we see the people, they they had high moments when people were obedient to the Lord. We think about Joshua. All the generation of Joshua was faithful to the Lord. Joshua was faithful, and he led the people to be faithful. And yet we find after that the period of Judges when the people would constantly go through these cycles Rebelling against the Lord, a foreign army would come in, take over. They would cry out to the Lord. The Lord would deliver them. He would raise up a judge which would deliver them. And that generation would die off, and then another generation would come along, and they would ignore the Lord, and they would rebel against him, and God would send in another army and take over everything. And then finally, when they cried out to the Lord, the Lord would raise up a judge, and the judge would lead the people. We see this cycle over and over and over again. And then we come into the later times. Joel is much later than the time of the judges. But again, we see the people who will not learn from the past. Who will not learn that disobedience against God would bring them under the discipline of God. And so here in this passage today, Joel tells us about a time when God sent the locusts to devour everything. Because they'd rebelled and disobeyed God. One of the problems that modern man has today is that we think nothing applies to us. We think that all laws are for somebody else. We're not responsible for anything. And anything that we do, we're, we're just a victim. It happened to us. It wasn't anything that we did. This is the attitude that pervades our society today. When the reality is, is that God has given us clear instructions that he means for us to follow. And if you're going to be a child of the Lord, then you need to obey the Lord. You see, just as the nation of Israel had very clear commandments, God has spoken to us today as well. Think about Matthew 22, what Jesus said. The Bible tells us here about an instance when a, when a man came up to test him with a question. And it says, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, Which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And this is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor and yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Jesus said we're to love God and we're to love people. Love is the linchpin that holds together all the commandments. Everything that God has told us to do is motivated by either helping us love him or helping us to love people. And so God gives us clear commandments today. And God expects us to follow his commandments. And the reality is, is that if you refuse to listen to God, there's several things that can go wrong. One problem is, when God tells us not to do something, 
It's for a good reason. It's for a good reason. There are things, lifestyles and habits and actions that in and of themselves will bring misery upon your life. And so you may be having a very difficult time right now that has nothing to do with the discipline of the Lord. Maybe living with the consequences of your own bad choices. And then in addition to the consequences, the natural consequences of sin, they just flow out of doing things that don't work and bringing things upon ourselves. There is the discipline of God. Because God loves us, he disciplines us. And this is not punishment for our sin. This is to try to get our attention and steer us in the right direction. So important that we understand that that love doesn't mean tolerating everything. But when my children were smaller, I I corrected them. I I don't have to correct them very often today because I corrected them when they were young. And I can remember I was at church one day and uh, they were small and I told one of them to do something and they didn't do it. And we were at a, we were at a wedding and it was a formal event. I didn't want them to make a scene. I didn't want them to and uh, I told them to do something. They didn't do it. And I I popped that leg. Somebody said, "Preacher, you're awful hard on those kids." If you love your kids, you won't let them raise themselves. It it won't work out. It won't. Love does not mean tolerating everything. And God doesn't show his love toward us by tolerating everything that we want to do. God shows his love toward us by disciplining us. And through the discipline of God, his motive is to draw us back to him. God's children, we must fear the discipline of the Lord. It should be motivating to us to understand that we must answer to God, not only in the life to come, but now and here. Hebrews 12, 6 talks about this. It says, For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastens every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Because this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Maybe you've had this thought. You look around and you see people living in sin and rebellion. And you think they, they get away with everything. Why does nothing ever happen to them? Well, it may be that they don't belong to the Lord. The Bible says that the Lord disciplines those who are his. Oh, but we come to verse 12 and 14. It's the, this great encouraging words that teach us that as long as we have breath, God is waiting for us to return to him. And listen to what he says in verse 12. He says, yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning. And listen to this passage. He says, And rend your hearts, not your garments. In the Old Testament times, people would tear their garments. It was a sign of mourning. And in a time where garments were made by hand, in a painstaking process, garments were valuable. Many people just had a couple of garments. It was all they owned. That's why the Bible talks about if you, if you take somebody's coat for collateral, you, you're not allowed to keep it overnight because they had to have it to sleep in at night. When it got cool, that was the only thing they had. And so when people would tear a garment, it would be like us keying our car today as a sign of mourning. 
to take something extremely valuable and destroy it. And yet God says to them, he says, rend your hearts and not your garments. And, and he wasn't saying for them to stop this practice of rending their garments. That's not what he was saying. But he was saying that God is concerned not about an outward show of repentance, but a true inward commitment to repentance. He said, rend your hearts and not your garments. You see, the key to understanding that God's grace and mercy is that he requires sincere sorrow over sin. I've heard people present the gospel before, and, and they, they say, if you just believe this and you just say this prayer, then you'll be saved. And they get somebody that doesn't even know half of what they're talking about and really doesn't understand what they just said. And they get on the pressure them to say in a quick prayer. And then they tell them, you know, now angels are rejoicing in heaven because you've been saved. Well, I, I'm here to tell you that that person in all likelihood has not been saved. They don't even know what it means to be saved. And the sinner's prayer, I believe in with all my heart, helping people pray the sinner's prayer, but it has to be your prayer. You have to understand it, and you have to desire to pray it. You can't be saved from sin without having a sincere sorrow over sin. God doesn't want us to merely do something outward. God wants us to do something inward. And so he says, rend your hearts and not your garments. In Jeremiah 29, 13, listen to what it says. You will seek me and find me. People like that part of the verse. But listen to the rest of the verse. He says, when you seek me with all your heart. God doesn't want us to merely do something outward. God wants us to seek him with all of our heart. You see, God's, God's grace and mercy makes it possible for us to return to him. Verse 13, it says, Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Do you know what that means? It means that even right now, if you are in the middle of being disciplined by God, God is doing everything that he can to get your attention. It's still not too late in that moment to turn to God and seek his mercy and his forgiveness. You see, through God's grace and mercy, we may even experience a blessing as we repent of our sin. Listen to verse 14. He says, I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I've driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. And what a promise for the people if they would just turn to him. And then in verse 14 of Joel chapter 2 it says, Who knows whether he will turn and relent and listen to this and leave a blessing behind him. A few years ago, I was talking with a pastor. He had been a pastor of a very large church. He had an affair with his secretary. I don't, it didn't last long. I don't, I don't remember if he got caught or if he confessed on his own. But he confessed that his sin. His wife forgave him. He obviously was no longer pastor of that church. But a few years had passed. And he was talking to me about his experience. And I, I'm, not, I'm not saying in any way to make light of that or to say it's not a major ordeal. It is. But he confessed that his sin. Never tried to cover it up. Never tried to make excuses. He confessed that his sin every time he talked about it. He admitted that he did it. He admitted that it was wrong. And he told me one day, he said, Kevin... He said, living on the other side of this, he said, the grace that I found from God, he said, all the time that I was a believer, all the time that I went to seminary, all the time that I was pastoring, I never knew that my relationship with the Lord could be this sweet. 
And some of you right now may be thinking, hey, that, that man's an adulterer. But well, he is. So was David. And what did the Bible say about David? He said he was a man after God's own heart. You see, when we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is the mercy and the grace of God. And sometimes he even gives us a blessing in the midst of it. Verses 15 through 17, I want you to notice this. We're living in a time where people are so individualistic. Everybody wants to do their own thing. Everybody wants to do it their own way. And so people, people don't want to come to church. I can't tell you how many people told me, Pastor, you can pray and worship God at home. And I always say, you can and you should, in addition to worshiping and praying as the Lord has commanded us, assembled together. Notice what the Bible says in verses 15 through 17. He says, blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call, notice these words, a solemn assembly. Assembly, by the, word, by the way, is the word for synagogue and the word for church. All those words mean assembly. From the oldest times to the present time, God's plan has been to assemble his people together. That's why we're here today. That's why as beneficial as radio and internet ministries may be, they will never replace the local church because God's plan is for us to assemble together. Verse 16, notice what it says, gather the people. Same thing. Then it says, consecrate the congregation. Then it says, assemble the elders. Do you see this? God says the same thing over and over and over again. God's message through Joel to bring the people to repentance was to bring the people to repentance. Not one-on-one. -on -one. Not each person off in a quiet time on the mountain by themselves. But no, God's plan was to bring the people together and in the assembly for them to hear the message that would bring them to repentance. And so I would encourage you today to share your faith with people. But it's equally important that we invite people to the assembly because it's God's plan to bring about people's repentance through the church. Because of God's grace and mercy, none of us, none of us have sinned to the point that we cannot be forgiven and that we cannot be restored. So I would encourage you today Yet even now, no matter where you are, yet even now, return to the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you'd help us to search our hearts and to be honest about our sin. Would you reveal to us our motives and our intentions, our distractions and our wrong affections. And Father, I pray right now for the person that Maybe they want to serve you, but through ignorance and misunderstanding, they, just, they believe that it's too late for them. God, would you help them this morning to understand that they can have a close, intimate relationship with you. And Father, I pray that you'd use this church to communicate this message to Madisonville and to people all over the world. For it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.